from the Digital Media Center on the campus of Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon. This is Ramping Up Your English, an educational program for intermediate level English language learners. Here's your host for Ramping Up Your English, John Letts. Welcome to Ramping Up Your English, an educational support program for intermediate English learners. It's a program for people of all language backgrounds. Ramping Up Your English is also for people of all ages. If you've already passed the beginning stages of learning English and you want to reach higher levels of proficiency, this program is designed to meet your needs. We take a content-based approach to helping you reach higher levels of English proficiency. Our current thematic unit is Animals. This is segment one of episode 39. Our last episode focused on pets. I think of my own earliest experience with America's most popular pets, cats and dogs. Now I have the memory of when I was very young and my little sister and I were walking on the sidewalk on our block and that's where we saw this young gray and black cat that came up to us and started following us. We brought the cat home and asked my mom if she, we could keep it. Well, she said we'd have to wait till my dad got home from work. So when we asked about keeping the cat, later our dad had a few wise things to say. He told us that this cat would need for us to feed it and give it water, not just today, but for many years. Now he asked if we promised to do this, and of course we said we would. He repeated that we'd need to feed the cat even when we didn't feel like it. Now, I didn't think he would say yes, but that is what he said after we promised to be good pet owners. We called this cat Darling, and it wasn't long before Darling had kittens. This riveted our attention. While Darling was an outside cat like most of our neighborhood, she was provided with a soft nest inside a wooden crate inside the house and we watched in awe as she gave birth to three tiny kittens. We got to see them nurse, and we got to see Darling gently groom them and purr for them. It was some time after that that Darling got spayed, fixed with an operation, so she couldn't have more kittens. Now, we had given away all but one kitten, and when Darling came back from the vet wearing a bandage, she was again provided a nest in the house, and now it was the kitten who took gentle care of her mom. Now, there were also dogs in my life, although my immediate family never had one as part of uh, my pets. My uncle had surprised my grandmother with a half-grown puppy for Christmas one year. My earliest memory of this dog, named Corky, was that Christmas morning. And while she surely kept my grandmother company, this dog also became my faithful companion. I was not a kind of kid who could sit still, so while other family members sat and talked, Corky and I would run around together on the farm. My uncle would have had uh, many other dogs over the years. In fact, he did. People packed off unwanted dogs to the country, and some of them found their way to my uncle's farm. Those who were friendly usually got to stay. And whenever I went walking around the farm, there seemed to always be a dog tagging along. I've raced, chased, and been chased playfully by dogs on that farm. And when I look back on my childhood, I can't imagine what it would have been like to grow up without pets. Our cat in town and the dogs in the country were my constant companions. I didn't always appreciate them at the time, but I'm sure my life would have been very different without them. So I had the benefit of having both cats and dogs as pets. Not, now, not everyone likes both of these pets. My dad, for example, was a cat person. He really had no desire to have a dog as a pet. And I've met people who love dogs but dislike cats. Now, while I love both cats and dogs, and while they're both popular pets, there are fundamental differences between the two. This creates a great opportunity for us to ramp up the English, the function of comparing and contrasting these well-known animals. First, let's look at what's true about both cats and dogs. 
Both pets are mammals. This means that cats and dogs both have fur. They're warm-blooded, meaning that their bodies produce their own heat. They give milk to their young who have live birth. True for cats and dogs. Dogs and cats share their position as the most popular pets. They also have sharp teeth and they make vocalizations. Now we can use a Venn diagram to reflect this knowledge. At this point, we're only establishing what's true about both cats and dogs. So we have an overlapping section on the chart, the green section titled both. Now we added mammals because they're both mammals. Now we add that they're both popular pets. We also add that they have sharp teeth. Hopefully you've never been bitten by your pet. Now we add in the green overlapping section that they make vocalizations, certain sounds or noises. Now we're concerned with characteristics that are unique to cats compared to things that are true about dogs. Now cats can pull their claws into their feet removing them from sight. This is called retractable claws. Cats are usually independent, needing less of their owner's attention than dogs. The kind of teeth possessed by cats are very pointed and sharp. These teeth are known as feline teeth. The vocalizations of cats are also unique. They say meow and they purr and some even trill. These vocalizations help their kittens find them and they have a calming effect. Now we can use one side of the Venn diagram to list the characteristics of cats, starting with their retractable claws. Notice the label cats on the yellow side of the chart. We add the details of their vocalizations, meow, purr, and trill. Now we add the cat's well-known independence. We won't forget the teeth either. They mark a noticeable difference between cats and dogs. Now, now that we have the cat side of the chart filled out, let's consider dogs, especially as they relate to the unique characteristics of cats. Unlike cats, the claws of a dog's feet don't retract. Since they have contact with the ground as a dog walks and runs, a dog's claws are usually not as sharp as a cat's claws. Now, we don't hear a dog meowing or purring. Instead, they bark, growl, or groan most dogs are more dependent on their owners than cats. While they both depend on their owners for food and water and medical attention, most dogs need more personal attention from their owners. And finally, dogs have canine teeth. They are pointed and sharp, but they are different from the teeth of a cat. Now we use the other side of the chart, the blue side, to list the unique characteristics of dogs. We start with their non-retracting claws. We add their vocalizations, barking, growling, and groaning. We include the part about the dogs being more dependent. And we add the type of teeth they have. Now our chart is complete and we're ready to write some sentences. Now here's where we learn today's objectives of using contractions, excuse me, conjunctions to compare and contrast two objects. Let's start in the middle. Look at the title of the green section. The word both is very important to comparing. In an academic sense, comparing is showing how two objects are alike. Let's read the chart. Mammals, popular pets, sharp teeth, and vocalizations. Any of these can be used in the comparison. Now this marks the end of segment one of episode 39. We'll start building those sentences in segment two. You're watching Ramping Up Your English, a program designed to help you improve your English. This is segment two of episode 39. Today we're helping you use English to compare and contrast. We're using information on dogs and cats. Again, we look at the green section of the chart. Let's focus on the first item, and that's cats and dogs are both mammals. There's a lot about being a mammal that makes dogs and cats good pets. We use the word both to show we're describing how they're alike. We focus on their fur and their body temperature since these help explain their appeal as pets. Notice the importance of the word both. Now we restate their popularity. We use the word share to show that we're comparing. 
This time we write about the vocalizations of both kinds of animals. We use the simple word and to show that we are comparing. Now that we've compared the two, let's start our statements about how they're different from each other. That's contrasting. Again, we consult our chart. Let's start with the claws. Cats can contract them, dogs can't. First, let's announce that we're shifting gears and starting to contrast. We use the word while because it shows that we're identifying a feature that they both have in common, but one which has differences between them. We show that they're, we're stating two or more differences when we use the phrase for one thing. We describe the difference, then we simply state that a dog can't retract its claws. Then we state the effect of this difference. We indicate that we're pointing out another contrasting feature when we state another difference. Again, we use the word while, and we also use the word in contrast to identify another difference. Now, looking back at the Venn diagram, we've used three of the traits in the middle to compare dogs and cats, and we've used two of the differences to contrast the two. I'm going to have you do the same for the two remaining points. Use the fact that they have sharp teeth to compare them. Then use the teeth and the independence issue to show how they contrast. Remember, using the words both, while, and difference can help you achieve the function of comparing and contrasting two well-known objects. Now you can use the examples I used on this episode to help you practice making your own sentences. They're all posted on my website, letscreate.org. You can also watch the entire episode by clicking on the link there. You can also go beyond the assignment and get more practice. Add your own observation to the Venn diagram, or you can choose two other objects to compare and contrast. Looking at how dogs and cats are alike and how they're different may help your thinking process, not only in comparing and contrasting, but also in learning that differences are not bad things. Learning to respect differences is a vital life skill and one that seems to be lacking in our world. Use the light side of the force. After all, you're working to improve on a different language than the one to which you're comfortable. You're already stepping into the light. We'll learn something about the dark side of these beloved animals when we return. What's a horse doing on ramping up your English? We're galloping toward a new unit, animals. So we're in the country meeting some horses. Horses are just one of the many animals that will help viewers ramp up their English. So funny. Our Mr. Cowboy, you loving that? Horses, boy, I'm, I'm getting the flies. You see, horses have to deal with flies. Coming soon to RVTV Voices, a new unit on ramping up your English, an educational support program for intermediate level English learners from all language backgrounds. So how can horses help you improve your English? Watch Ramping Up Your English to find out on channels 15 and 115 in Ashland and channel 182 on Charter Cable in Southern Oregon. Welcome back to Ramping Up Your English. This is segment three of episode 39. Earlier this episode, we saw that the most popular pets are cats and dogs, and they are all mammals, or both of them, I should say, are mammals. It's some of these mammal traits that makes them such great pets, but there's a dark side to being a mammal. When I was growing up, I was also told about dogs having a disease called rabies. This disease is a serious public health threat. Rabies is the subject of a TV program entitled Animals Impacting Our Health, produced by Bob Schropp here at RVTV. We're going to share with you part of that program. To help you understand what you hear, I'll take some time to tell you some of the words you'll hear and what they mean. The word bat is often used. A bat is a mammal that can fly. In Spanish, we call them murcielagos. 
Another word is fox, a medium-sized mammal known as a zorro in the Spanish-speaking world. Of course, by now, you know the word dog, and I just told you about the disease we'll discuss, the word rabies. Prepared with that information, let's see how much you understand of this segment of animals impacting our health. Welcome to Animals Impacting Our Health, a series of interviews that will provide the public in the Rogue Valley with a better understanding of the importance of keeping pets healthy and vaccinated through regular checkups with their primary care veterinarian. Also, introduce the public to the broad impact of infectious disease in our pets, food animals, and the local community in Oregon. In addition to elevating and expanding the public's perception of the profession of veterinary medicine through the introduction of various levels of state and local veterinarians and regulation agencies. Animals Impacting Our Health presents a three-part interview with Dr. Emilio DeBest discussing rabies, the threat, the truth, and the treatment. Dr. DeBest is the state public health veterinarian for the state of Oregon, and his emphasis is in infectious and zoonotic diseases. Well, welcome to part two of Rabies, the Truth, of our series called Animals Impacting Our Health with our special guest, Dr. Emilio DeBess. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. So for just f for anybody who had missed the um, first show, could you uh, do a little review of what is rabies and how it impacts us? Sure. So rabies is an actual, it's a disease that causes uh, brain disease. So the virus itself actually goes into the brain and cause, causes severe damage of the brain. Uh, the reason why it is an important disease is because people throughout the world do die of rabies at the tune of about 50,000, 55,000 people a year. In the United States, we only have about three, maybe two to four people a year and that is because of the good medical care that we have in this country. But it is a significant disease of not only the, throughout the world, but in the United States as well. And, and a little review on how is it spread? So most people get infected with rabies through animal bites. Mm -hmm. So all warm blooded animals can actually carry rabies. Uh, in countries such as Mexico or China or India, dogs are the primary carriers of the disease. In the United States, we have other animals, such as raccoons, skunks, and bats. Okay, and um, we're gonna show some, uh, some maps of uh, first the world, and then the United States, and then specifically for Oregon, and we'd, we'd like to talk about the incidence of rabies in the world, and specifically in Oregon. Yes. So um, we have the first uh, slide is about uh, what is going on with rabies throughout the world. And as you can see, most of the continents in um, the world have rabies. So a lot of it, um, the map actually is a good indication of what you need to be aware of when you travel throughout the world and the possibilities of being exposed to rabies. Um, as you can see, both the United States, Central and South America are considered to be a fairly significant uh, source of rabies, um, as well as uh, countries in Asia and in Africa. Mm. That's pretty amazing. Um, so let's move on to the United States and uh, the incidence of rabies in the United States. Yeah, in the United States, we have a little bit of a different uh, situation. As you can see, the east, uh, the east side of the United States has raccoon rabies. And that has been a, a fairly significant uh, problem for the last 15 to 20 years in when, when raccoon rabies became a problem. And it actually has spread throughout the East Coast and they're trying very hard to uh, contain the disease. In the central part of the United States, uh, skunk lead the way in terms of the primary animals uh, creating a source of rabies for human exposure. 
and some foxes in central, te se central and southern Texas. And then uh, on the west coast, uh, skunks in some parts of California can actually uh, are of concern in regards to rabies transmission. Uh, what this map is not telling us is that throughout the United States, bats are the primary carriers of the disease. So um, this map is basically giving us the information as to what kind of terrestrial animals or animals on land actually carry or can carry the disease. And bats are the number one carriers in the United States as well. Where did rabies come from? Rabies uh, comes from, uh, the, the source of rabies is obviously unknown, but it's actually a disease that has been maintained uh, in the population of bats throughout the world as well as other animals. So uh, the disease actually has what we call a reservoir, meaning uh, a, a, an animal that actually carries the disease and passes it on to another, in the, to another animal that maintains that animal uh, within the environment and within population of animals. So for example, bats in the United States are considered to be the reservoir for rabies, at least in, uh, on the West Coast where we are, because they are the primary source of rabies. So how long has it been around then? It's been around for thousands of years. <laughs> thousands of years. Yes. That's pretty amazing. So let's go back, let's, let's go to Oregon and uh, and, and look what's been going on since, what are we looking at, 2010? 2010. 2010, okay. So we talked about rabies on, uh, in the United States and the primary animals, the bat. So bats are considered to be our primary source of rabies in the United States on the West Coast and definitely in Oregon. Uh, in 2010, we had a very interesting uh, situation in which in uh, Josephine County, we actually found a goat uh, that tested positive for rabies. And uh, when that goat uh, tested positive for rabies, the samples were actually sent to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, to determine what kind of rabies that would have been. And we l quickly learned that uh, that goat was infected through a bat. So a bat that had rabies actually infected the goat and created that problem. Um, since then, we, um, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Health Division and the County Health Department uh, decided to do a little bit more of a surveillance process uh, by which we collected animals that were ill, um, terrestrial animals that were ill, and we did find a number of foxes positive for rabies in that area as well. Again, those, uh, those samples were sent to the CDC and those foxes came back as bat rabies. So we, in Oregon, bat rabies continues to be the primary problem. That can actually affect not only humans, but other animals. And I would imagine it would be a concern if one goat was discovered with rabies that there would be others. Correct. And the herd of goats, or where that goat uh, came from, we actually had to quarantine that herd to make sure that no other animals actually came down with rabies. And fortunately, no, no other goat uh, came down with rabies. You breathed a sigh of relief then. A little bit, yes. <laughs> so is it like one bat that will carry it, um, where it, it bit one goat, and then maybe a fox, or these... Can you tell how many number of bats are carrying rabies? Correct. So we look at uh, the population of bats in, in, in the United States, and there's an assessment or there's a, a perception that about half of a percent of the bats uh, in the United States can actually carry rabies. So it's a very, very small percentage. In Oregon, about 10% of the bats that we test, and those are bats that have actually exposed or have bitten humans or animals, actually carry rabies. So it's a little bit of a, different, a difference. Uh, half of a percent of those bats in nature, 10% of those are those, that, those bats that we test for rabies because they have exposed either a human or an animal. Okay, so what is, was the incident rating of uh 
rabies in Oregon in 2010? In 2010, it was about 10% of the bats tested positive for rabies. Okay. Yes. As, well, what about humans? And so the last human case uh, in Oregon was actually in 1989. Uh, in, in Oregon was in 1989, and it happened to be a Mexican national who came to Oregon to work and develop rabies after being bitten by a Mexican dog. Okay. So we haven't had any uh, cases within the state or of, of cases that hum of humans that have contracted the infection within the state. So it's no longer just dogs carrying the disease in the United States. That doesn't happen anymore yet it persists in bats and animals bitten by them, like goats, in the case in Oregon. Now, it's still in dogs in Mexico and parts of Asia, so rabies is still very much with us in the world. Visit my website, letscreate.org, for a link to the entire program, Animals Impacting Our Health, produced by Bob Schropp. You can also watch all of our episodes of Ramping Up Your English at the same website, along with homework and instructional material. You can watch and download today's program at archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. Watch Ramping Up Your English on Ashland Home Network channel 15 or on channel uh, 182 on Charter Cable. That's Charter Cable in Southern Oregon. Program times are 8 a.m. on Mondays and 7.30 p.m. on Thursdays. Showtimes and channels may vary in other areas. I want to thank producer Bob Schropp for the use of this program, Animals Impacting Our Health. I want to thank my technical crew for their great service, and I want to thank you, our viewers. Join us next time for Ramping Up Your English. I'm John Letts. You've been watching Ramping Up Your English, a support program for intermediate level English language learners. Learn more visit our website at letscreate.org. You can also watch or download today's program at archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. Join us next time on RBTV Voices for Ramping Up Your English.